Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Paloma Jangrande from the University of Iowa. So I've been instructed today to tell you about aptamers uh, and aptamer technology, uh, which we refer to as CELEX. And so what I'll try to do over the next 30 minutes or so is to give you like a historical perspective of how aptamers uh, were um, developed and identified uh, touch upon some recent advancements on aptamer technology, uh, and then uh, uh, give you sort of um, a little bit of so where we're going in the future, a view into the future of you know what are the potentials for um, uh, getting aptamers into the clinic, um, applications of you know future applications of aptamers, um, and also uh, troubleshooting and hurdles that we still need to meet. Um, Okay, so here's really my conclusion slide, and I hope that by the end of this 30-minute presentation, I can convince you that we can essentially develop aptamers if we use the right selection conditions and the right formulations for these drugs uh, to develop powerful oligonucleotide drugs can, that can be used to treat v many different diseases. We already have one aptamer that's approved for eye diseases, um, but we can also develop uh, drugs for cardiovascular disease, uh, cancer, neurological disease, antivirals, uh, and, and immunotherapy. So what are aptamers? So uh, aptamers are highly structured, uh, short, single-stranded DNA or RNA oligonucleotide, and they were first discovered in 1990 when three seminal papers uh, were published all at the same time, two in Nature and, uh, and one in Science. Um, so the first paper by Turk and Gold, uh, this was actually the first paper that described the actual selection, this iterative process of discovering our aptamers that I'll tell you more about in, 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 in the next slide, uh, that he referred to as CELEX, or systemic evolution of, uh, systematic evolution of ligands by exponential enrichment. And here you can see Turk himself and Gold, uh, that was last year in New Orleans at an aptamer symposium uh, celebrating the 25th anniversary uh, of aptamers and CELEX. Uh, Robertson and Joyce, uh, they also described the CELEX uh, process, and they were the first to really um, describe functional aptamers, uh, like aptamers RNA enzymes uh, that can cleave single-stranded DNA, and that was the example that they published in their Nature paper. There was also nice work from Ellington and Sostak, who were the first to coin the term aptamers, which comes from the Latin word aptus, to fit, uh, and the Greek word meris, which implies a part, so fit into a part. So what, uh, because we're at the oligonucleotide therapeutic meeting, uh, what are some of the advantages of these particular class of oligonucleotides um, as therapeutics? Uh, as I mentioned, they're highly structured, um, and, uh, and because of their um, uh, very complex three-dimensional um, properties, uh, here is uh, a, a rendition of one of my favorite aptamer, an aptamer to prostate-specific membrane antigen, or PSMA, and so you can really appreciate the complex three-dimensional structure of this uh, particular RNA. Uh, and because of this, aptamers, like antibodies, have particular high affinity and specificity for their targets. However, unlike antibodies, um, aptamers, and so for that reason, there you go, they're um, referred to as these are chemical antibodies or nucleic acid antibodies. However, unlike antibodies, they're very small, so they, uh, it, it's thought that they have better tissue pen penetration, and so um, are very good for such applications as cancer, where you're really trying to get those reagents uh, uh, to target the particular disease or organ. Um, they also are easily chemically modifiable uh, with all the uh, chemistries that we may be familiar with uh, that we are applying to other types, other classes of oligonucleotides. Uh, and importantly, these chemistries um, are, are, are used to increase the stability of aptamers. This is particularly key for RNA-type aptamers, where RNA is a lot less stable than DNA-type uh, aptamers. Chemistries are also really important to reduce the toxicity uh, or potential toxicities of these reagents in vivo. We are all familiar with the fact that RNA can be immunogenic uh, uh, when injected uh, in intravenously. Um, and also, uh, really importantly, we can do nice things like combination uh, uh, therapy uh, by conjugating with chemistry uh, aptamers to other type of molecule or therapeutic drugs. Um, 
aptamers are easily manufactured, and we heard a little bit about manufacturing from Mark in the, in, in the previous uh, talk. Uh, and they can be easily manufactured uh, through chemical synthesis, especially if they're relatively short in sequence or less than 60 nucleotide in length. They can be easily scaled up, as um, Mark uh, has alluded to, and a, a lot of advancements has been made over uh, uh, in the scale up of these reagents over the past 10 years. Uh, and they can be rapidly discovered by this in vitro uh, iter process that I referred to uh, in my earlier slide that's known as Celex. So what exactly is Celex? And so here's a, um, a depiction of Celex that's used for making RNA aptamers. This is very similar to the Celex that's used for the DNA type aptamers, uh, but for the DNA type aptamers, we omit the step of um, converting the double-stranded DNA library into a single-stranded DNA library using in vitro transcription. Okay, so how does this work? So we actually uh, start with a double-stranded DNA library that's sort of depicted here. This is uh, a, a library that um, it, the characteristic is uh, a, uh, a variable region shown here in, in red uh, that can vary in length anywhere uh, between uh, 10 to 60 or nine, uh, 90 nucleotides, and that confers the, uh, the um, uh, diversity uh, to this library. Um, this variable region uh, is uh, uh, flanked by two constant regions, uh, which are there, so uh, we know those sequences, and we can design primers to those sequences, and then uh, PCR amplify those sequences out of the selection. Uh, so this double-stranded library uh, via in vitro transcription is converted to a single-stranded RNA library, and this is a key step for those of us who are interested in then converting these aptamers into, um, you know, for therapeutic applications into drugs. Um, we perform this step uh, in the presence of modified NTPs. Uh, here I'm showing the 2' fluoro uh, modification uh, where the 2' position uh, is modified with a fluoro. Uh, and this is important to, um, uh, in part to these RNA uh, properties such as resistant to nuclease degradation as well as render them um, uh, non-immunostimulatory, -immun so safer. Um, uh, so then we take this uh, chemically modified library um, and we can uh, combine that with a target of interest. Uh, people have used many different types of targets, including small molecules, peptides, uh, recombinant purified proteins, whole cell selex uh, has also been performed where the library has been directly applied to live cells and culture. Uh, and uh, more recently, there's uh, two examples of uh, selections done um, in, in, in whole animals where the library has actually been injected uh, uh, systemically uh, IV uh, in animals um, and, and the organs, the target organs uh, were retrieved to then um, uh, see what types of sequences were going preferentially to these target organs. Uh, the aptamers are typically allowed to bind with their targets, and then as this step, which we refer to as the wash step, this is where we can really impart sort of the characteristics to, this, uh, to these uh, aptamer sequences that we're after. Uh, for example, so this is this, what we refer to as the selection step uh, of, the, uh, of the selection. Um, if we want an aptamer that binds at low pH, we can apply a low pH wash at this step. Uh, and remove anything that comes off and get rid of that, and then keep only those sequences that are still bound uh, at, under the conditions of low pH. Uh, we then elute those aptamers that are still bound and uh, repeat this process uh, by um, uh, amplifying via PCR uh, and, and, and repeat several cycles of this process until we really enrich for sequences that have the properties and characteristics that we're after. Um, so this particular early Celex um, methodology has been used to identify many different uh, types of aptamers, uh, as I alluded to here. Um, but since then, there's been seven, several advances in the technology um, which have tried to improve on the types of sequences that are coming out of these selections. And, and one of the examples is uh, to really uh, improve the specificity of the sequences, and that was done by introducing uh, a step that's known as negative selection, uh, but also to efficiently partition 
those aptamers that are true binders versus the ones that are not true binders. And work in this area um, has taken advantage of things like capillary electrophoresis, flow cytometry, micro, micro, microfluidics, as well as uh, SPR. And there's some nice work that's been done in this area by uh, Maxime Berzowski and, and Tom So. Um, in addition to uh, efficient partitioning and recovery, uh, there's a lot of work that's also been done in accurate amplification. So instead of using the conventional PCR uh, approach to amplify these sequences, uh, that is, um, uh, unfortunately, uh, causes a lot of um, uh, uh, aberrant amplification of transcripts, um, and also we lose a lot of those um, uh, a lot of those RNAs or DNA molecules uh, that are highly structured uh, uh, during the PCR uh, uh, amplification step. And now we've introduced uh, different types of PCR amplifications uh, that get rid uh, of these uh, PCR bias, uh, and that's uh, uh, with the use of emulsion PCR or ePCR and drop, uh, droplet digital uh, PCR approaches. And finally, um, Celex has been combined with uh, uh, various high throughput sequencing uh, technologies, and this has been really important in trying to fish out those uh, key or winner sequences right from the early stages of selections, the early round of selections, where there are very few, um, it, where the uh, amplification bias, I guess, is, is, is very low. Uh, and, um, and I want to give you an example of that. Um, so Tom So, I need to remind you, is going to give a talk um, on Tuesday in the Aptimer session. So uh, please note that he'll talk about many of these advancements in the technology. So in terms of um, uh, the advances uh, that have uh, uh, made possible selecting aptamers to really complex targets like whole cells, uh, back in uh, 2012, a postdoc, Bill Thiel, in my lab, published uh, a really uh, interesting paper. Uh, and his goal was to uh, select aptamers to a particular cell type in the vasculature, smooth muscle cells. But he noticed that the selection was, uh, was way too complex and he was getting random sequences out of the selection. So in order for this selection to work for him, he had to introduce both a step of uh, prickly or negative selection uh, against a different cell type present in the vasculature. And so he chose endothelial cells in this case, um, and then panned against a positive selection, which were his vascular smooth muscle cells. He also combined the whole cell selex approach with the negative selection, positive selection, with high throughput sequencing technology. Uh, he used Illumina at the time um, and performed stringent bioinformatic analysis that allowed him to really found uh, those sequences that were specific for binding to smooth muscle cells, but did not bind uh, or, or internalize uh, into the endothelial cells. And so this work is published. I'm not going to go into the details. Uh, but uh, without uh, the introduction of high-throughput sequence, all bioinformatics, uh, there was uh, uh, basically no way that these sequences uh, uh, could have been um, identified. Uh, so, um, what has been the recent progress in aptamer-based therapeutics uh, that has come out from all these uh, advances in the technology? Um, and there have been uh, many aptamers that ha have been described that have that work exquisitely uh, well in uh, in vivo, uh, and they act as antagonists or inhibitors of their targets. Um, one example here, I want to go back to that PSMA aptamer that you may recall from uh, in, in my introductory slide. Uh, that PSMA aptamer binds to process-specific membrane antigen, uh, which is uh, highly expressed on prostate cancer cells. So we chose to take that aptamer uh, and inject it in, uh, intravenously uh, by tail vein injection uh, in, the, in, in, in the tails of mice uh, that um, uh, have been injected with uh, prostate cancer cells. And here what you're seeing is a metastatic model of prostate cancer, where the cancer cells are injected in the hearts of mice so that they can disseminate systemically. So when this aptamer is also applied uh, in, this, uh, in these animals, what we found was that at low doses, uh, such as 0.1 mg per kg administered IV, uh, that the aptamer could drastically reduce or significantly reduce the percentage of mice with metastases and also the number of metastases per mouse. So this aptamer is, is really acting to uh, block um, de novo metastases from forming or dissemination, uh, cancer dissemination. 
In addition to um, aptamer inhibitors, the field has also described aptamers as agonists or activators, um, and, and there's been a, a few labs uh, who've dominated this field, mostly uh, the lab of Ellie Gilbo at the University of Miami and the lab of Fernando Pasteur um, in, in Spain and Pamplona, who uh, trained with Ellie Gilboa. Um, and these are aptamers that are targeted to T cell co-stimulatory receptors such as 4-1-BB, OX40, or CD28 um, to potentiate uh, an immune response or modulate an immune response and are being evaluated for uh, applications like cancer immunotherapy. And here I'm giving an example of really the first description or one of these agonistic aptamers, which was the aptamer that James McNamara, a postdoc in Ellie's lab, developed um, back in 2008, which is an aptamer to 4-1-BB, and here's one aptamer and here's the other one, uh, and they were multimerized um, uh, via this linker here. <coughs> and what they show is that this aptamer, 4-1-BB, when dimerized, can provide a long-lasting protection against mastocytoma uh, in a model of, uh, of challenge, uh, of tumor challenge. And so here they compare this uh, aptamer dimer shown here to an antibody that has been used clinically uh, uh, against 4-1-BB, and they're showing that in mice, at least in this tumor model of challenge, that their aptamer works just as well, if not better, than the antibody. Uh, agonistic aptamers have also been developed by CD40, and this is work that's being led by Fernando Pasteur, uh, and this is a, 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 a protein expressed on antigen-presenting cells, and they're using this for uh, the treatment of B-cell lymphoma and, and bone marrow aplasia. Um, and what's interesting about this aptamer is that they can, depending on how they make the aptamer, if it's a monomer, the aptamer acts actually as an antagonist, as an inhibitor, but when they multimerize, the aptamer changes its nature and now becomes um, an agonist of, of the target. They've also used this particular configuration of the aptamer a dimer or multimer uh, to conjugate it to uh, shRNAs and deliver shRNAs uh, in, uh, into cells. And so in addition to um, act activating aptamers, aptamers has, have also been shown um, to be able to deliver uh, different types of agents uh, to their target cells. And this is uh, in part due to their exquisite ability to bind to targets uh, on the surface of cells. And so here I want to give you a few examples of that. We pioneered the use of aptamers for delivery of RNAi effector molecules such as uh, siRNAs, and since then there's been a lot of work done in, in this area. Uh, and it, it's also included the delivery of uh, uh, hairpin, small hairpin RNAs, as well as the delivery of uh, micro endogenous uh, microRNAs. Um, more recently, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Gilboa and Dr. Pasteur have delivered aptamers with aptamers, again, for uh, applications in cancer immunotherapy, and I would encourage you to go and look up some of those studies. Uh, and again, more recently, uh, from the lab of Bruce Salinger at Duke University, um, he used an aptamer to nucleolin, a DNA aptamer, to deliver antisense to cancer cells uh, in vitro. Um, in addition to RNAi um, effector molecules, uh, aptamers have been uh, conjugated to small molecule drugs um, as well as uh, protein drug um, uh, conjugates uh, that have been delivered uh, very efficiently to cells uh, in vitro and uh, in vivo. And here I just wanted to leave you with uh, an example of the exquisite ability of these reagents to target uh, in vivo. Uh, and this is here is an animal model, again using that same aptamer that I alluded to before, an aptamer to PSMA uh, that we uh, conjugated to a, a near-infrared dye so that we could follow uh, its biodistribution in vivo. And what I'm showing here is an animal that's been injected uh, on the right flank with a tumor that expresses PSMA, uh, and on the left flank a PSMA a negative tumor, we injected uh, this uh, NIR-labeled uh, aptamer in the uh, tail veins of these mice and then followed it over time. Um, we also did the same thing with a control aptamer that does not bind the PSMA target. And so as, uh, what you can appreciate immediately is that with the uh, 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 wild type or the PSMA aptamer, you can get nice uptake uh, of this RNA in the tumor, uh, which we believe is uh, active uptake into the tumor and not 
passive uh, uptake due to a potential uh, enhanced permeability or retention effect uh, that we see with macromolecules uh, when we're looking at uh, tumor uptake. Uh, so um, why is it then, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the classic question is that, you know, these aptamers have all these great properties for, uh, for therapeutic drugs. Uh, why is it then that we don't have um, many aptamers uh, in the clinic? Uh, there is one aptamer that has been approved uh, for eye diseases, and that's the macugen aptamer that was developed uh, against uh, vascular endothelial growth factor, in particular a mutant form of uh, VEGF this uh, 165 mutant that's often overexpressed in macular degeneration. Um, and so this was uh, uh, approved about 10 years ago or so. There are several other aptamers in the clinical pipeline, both, um, both in phase one through three clinical trials, as well as in preclinical studies that are slowly uh, moving along. And I hope that uh, pretty soon we'll hear some positive results from some of these studies. And as you can, you know, as noted here, uh, these aptamers um, are being developed for many different types of diseases, uh, such as uh, cancer, inflammation, obesity, diabetes, um, more against uh, eye diseases, uh, hematology, cardiovascular diseases, um, um, as well as transplant rejection and other immunological uh, responses. Um, so, um, you know, hopefully in a couple of years I can update you on some of these studies, but there's a lot of precedent and, uh, and, 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 and a lot of excitement uh, uh, behind developing these aptamer-based drugs. So what are some of the uh, problems um, that have, or challenges that have hindered sort of uh, the progress of, of, of these reagents into the, the clinic? Um, and here I'm listing a few, in particular nuclease degradation. This is common to many oligonucleotide-based uh, uh, therapies. Um, and, and in order to circumvent that, uh, we have used modifications such as the fluoroamino or methyl modifications, like the ones that I've uh, alluded to previously. The modification strategies are twofold. They can be introduced directly during the selection process, so in cell X modifications of that two prime position, like I showed you. Um, as those are amenable uh, by the polymerases to incorporate into the aptamers, as well as post cell -like modifications of the base, as well as the two prime position, the sugar ring, or the phosphate group. Uh, another problem uh, and, and hurdle is the, uh, the fact that aptamers are quite small, as I alluded to previously. Uh, their diameter is less than five uh, uh, nanometers, and they're about uh, anywhere between six to 30 kilodaltons in size, which is right below that renal cutoff of 30 to 50 and, more clo and closer to 50, actually. So the way that um, you know, we have gone about to solve that is to conjugate bulky groups onto these, um, onto these aptamers. And we've used things like high molecular weight PEG, cholesterol, uh, proteins, liposomes, organic or inorganic nanomaterials. And what these molecules do, they uh, really uh, enhance the pharmacokinetic profile of these drugs, extend uh, their T1 half, their uh, circulating time, um, and also uh, prevent renal clearance or slow down renal clearance. Um, uh, these molecules, some of these molecules like cholesterol or depending on the protein that they, um, they um, are conjugated to, can also facilitate uh, delivery to specific, uh, specific organs. And finally, toxicity. We have very limited um, information about toxicity of these reagents. We do know that they're negatively charged molecules, and therefore they intrinsically display nonspecific binding to proteins in serum. This can be good or bad. Um, it, it can be bad in that they can be then delivered uh, or taken up into organs that you didn't intend to um, target. Uh, these chemical, uh, chemical modifications that are also used uh, to sort of dampen some of these um, uh, toxic response of these molecules can be a double-edged sword. Uh, these chemical modifications that make the aptamers in some ways safe and, not, and, and, and um, uh, unable to activate an immune response or make the aptamers uh, more stable for in vivo applications can be taken up by cells and incorporated directly into the cellular DNA for example. 
And finally, toxicity, so toxicity can also be due to the formulation of the drug, and in this particular study, uh, that was recently a report from uh, Regato, uh, their anticoagulant aptamer was uh, conjugated to a really high molecular weight peg, an 80, 80 kilodalton peg. Um, and um, what Regato showed is that they had several patients, a handful of patients, that developed an immune response uh, to, the, uh, to the peg, and these were patients that had uh, uh, PEG antibodies um, uh, prior to the uh, injection of the uh, pegylated aptamer. And Bruce Salinger on Tuesday will present uh, more information on, uh, on the results of this clinical study and uh, what we've learned from this study and, and where to move on from there, where to go on from there. So in order to improve some or overcome some of these challenges with formulation uh, and also uh, PK of these reagents, uh, several groups, including the group of uh, Bruce Solinger here, have played around with things such as multimerizing these aptamers as well as using aptamers in combination. Uh, and, and, and this is really important in that uh, if, if you multimerize the aptamers, you're making them bigger, uh, and so you are um, now improving their pharmaconegative properties. Uh, without having to conjugate necessarily the aptamer uh, to a, uh, a bulky group, for example, that could cause toxicity. Also, when using combinations, you can greatly enhance or you can get synergistic effects uh, and you can get greatly enhance the potency of these drugs in vivo. Aptamers have also been conjugated directly to antibodies to improve PK, and in this particular study here, an aptamer 2 VEGF um, that was conjugated to an antibody shows efficacy just as well as the uh, a therape uh, therapeutic drug, small molecule inhibitor, uh, and it also shows more efficacy compared uh, to the um, aptamer that's not, um, not conjugated uh, to the antibody that is rapidly cleared. Aptamers have been um, uh, conjugated to cholesterol, uh, as shown here, um, and this is, again, to improve PK. So as you can see here, this is uh, the non-cholesterol modified aptamer is cleared um, uh, really uh, rapidly, and here you can reduce the clearance quite drastically by conjugation to cholesterol and increase the uh, T1 half compared to the uh, unconjugated. In addition, this particular aptamer uh, was delivered to the liver, and it was delivered more efficiently with the uh, cholesterol conjugate. Uh, aptamers have been conjugated to nanoparticles. Uh, in this study, an aptamer to a mutant form of P53 uh, was shown to be uh, delivered quite efficiently, both intratumor, uh, using intratumor injection as well as intravenous injections uh, to the tumors. And in this particular example, the nanoparticle itself enhanced the ability of these tumors to take up this drug uh, due to that EPR effect that I alluded to earlier. Um, and finally, aptamers have been um, uh, sort of uh, conjugated, or not conjugated, but delivered using these pleuronic gel formulations. And this is an example that we published uh, where we combined uh, one of those aptamers to vascular spoon muscle cells um, uh, with pleuronic gel and delivered it to an injured vessel uh, in a mouse model in tumor hyperplasia and showed that the aptamer behaved just as well, was just as effective as a, a small molecule inhibitor uh, that uh, normally used in drug eluding stents to inhibit this pathological response. So in addition to, um, uh, to using aptamers for therapeutics, aptamers have been developed for many different diagnostic uh, applications, and really the leading uh, folks in this area are uh, the guys from Somalogic, um, from Boulder, Colorado, uh, who've used really interesting chemistry uh, for what they call their somomers, or slow off-rate modified aptamers, uh, that uh, have these uh, hydrophobic chemistries that render these aptamers uh, uh, to have really high affinity uh, and specificity for their targets, and you can develop aptamers even to targets that are really hard to target with uh, aptamer technology, such as negatively charged uh, uh, proteins um, or proteins with negatively charged epitopes. Um, the, um, so the Somalogic team has developed many different products and services, including SomaScan. These are large group of somomers uh, for protein biomarker discover, discovery and diagnosis. They uh, have have described somomer reagents, which are the individual aptamers that you can buy or purchase from them for therapeutic application, 
quantitative analysis, affinity purification, flow cytometry, et cetera, as well as smaller panels or the SOMA panels of the SOMAMERS for qualitative or quantitative analysis uh, of various uh, applications. And finally, uh, a software and proteomic tool analysis um, that can, known as the SOMA suite, uh, that can be used to facilitate many of these uh, discoveries. Um, and uh, we'll, on Tuesday, again, we'll have um, uh, Larry Gold here, who's going to discuss many of these applications of their technology. And so where are we heading in the future? I think the future of aptamers is actually really bright, and I hope that I can leave you with that, um, you know, uh, with that conclusion. Um, I think this really comes from the fact that uh, the end of the exclusive intellectual property of Celex technology that has previously limited the initial distribution um, uh, of, of the technology uh, is now no longer in place. And so this uh, is, is, I think, good news for moving the technology forward. Uh, we've also learned a lot from the past, so lesson learned from the outcome of failed clinical trials, but also uh, outcomes from technological advances that have been made in this area. Um, and now we have a better understanding of what the medical formulations are for some of these drugs and how to deliver them uh, in vivo, and also the PK and PD properties and toxicity uh, profiles that we have to deal with or try to improve uh, for effective therapeutic drugs. Um, we also feel that aptamers can actually fill a, a you know, specific niche uh, in the oligonucleotide market or just in the drug market, uh, and, and, and especially when it comes to developing d drugs at a fast rate, like we can do with, the, uh, with aptamers, uh, where we can develop fast drugs to fast track vaccines uh, or overcome viral emergence or mutations, and this can also uh, uh, be applied uh, to diseases such as cancer. Uh, and so with that, I'll end here, and I guess we can...